everyone. Welcome to my shop. I'm Mike Potvin, and uh, today I'm going to be answering questions from my email subscribers about building a guitar body. I see, uh, I see a lot of uh, faces I know in the chat. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys could make it. So um, just a quick uh, a bit of backstory, maybe. So if you're here live, then you're probably an email subscriber. And uh, that's awesome. Thanks for trusting me with your email. I appreciate that. And uh, that's why you know about this live Q&A. And so I'm answering your questions that you sent me. And if you're watching this in the future and uh, on the replay, and maybe you're not an email subscriber, well, thanks for watching anyway. And maybe consider jumping on my email list and I'll be able to tell you next time I do one of these. And you can be here live and uh, I'll answer your questions. So I see lots of friendlies in the chat. Thanks for being here again. Um, maybe uh, break the ice and let me know in the chat where you're watching from. And uh, I'll be able to say hi along the way if I can. So uh, just a bit of backstory here is uh, I've been building guitars for, well, a, a long time. I don't want to date myself too badly, but I've been building guitars for a long time professionally. And somewhere along the way, uh, as you probably know, I started offering a line of templates and jigs and uh, offering help to anyone who was trying to build their own guitar. And as you can imagine, that jiggles loose a lot of guitar building questions. Uh, everything from people who are interested in getting started building a body and uh, all, all the way up to people who do this professionally and they're looking for ways to uh, be more efficient in their shop or, uh, or, or just uh, all around make things easier in terms of building guitars. So that's where the questions come from. Today's questions are entirely from my email subscribers. And uh, I'll flip over here and give you a quick look at what we're talking about here. So there were lots of great questions. Uh, I can put them broadly into the categories that you see on your screen here. So that's pretty much everything from getting started with templates all the way to uh, some of the uh, so-called scarier things like bridge placement and neck pockets. So we'll get to those later on. Hey, Gary, Salt Lake City, awesome. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, flip over to my next slide here and we'll get rolling. Um, I'll probably, I should mention that I think if I really motor, I can get through these in about an hour or maybe an hour and 15 minutes, uh, depending on how many questions you guys have. But uh, I'll really try to keep the pedal to the metal so we can pack as much value in here as we can. So without any further ado, let's talk about template questions. Uh, the first one I usually get from people who've just ordered their templates, they are, uh, they're asking me questions about, should I seal the edges of the templates with something? Or even should I seal the entire template with something? The short answer to that is I don't. Uh, I know a lot of people do. The short reason for that would be either A, you're afraid of humidity. So if you live where it's super humid, maybe you want to consider that. Uh, the other reason is people often want to try to make the edges of the template where the router bearing rides more durable. And uh, I mean, I, I guess it works. The reality is I've made aluminum templates and I've seen people take chunks out of those. I don't make aluminum templates anymore, but I have on occasion in the past for some larger shops and they'll come back sometimes because they've taken a chunk out of an aluminum template. So do what works for you. I don't. Let's leave that there. Uh, the next question I get is, uh, Scott, thanks so much. That's very kind of you. That's cool. Uh, sorry, I, I get distracted easily here by all the fun comments. Uh, how do you fix minor damage on a template? Well, assuming you didn't take a big chunk out of it, in which case you probably can't do much to fix it. If you dinged it, like maybe you dropped it or uh, just bumped it with something, I've seen people, again, I've never done this, but I've seen people use auto body filler. So uh, here in Canada, that would be known as Bondo generically, or maybe that's a real product name. I don't know. But auto body filler is like a two-part putty that you mix and uh, use in automotive repairs, and it, and it sets up really, really hard, and it's very sandable, so you could reshape it. That's all I can really think of in terms of repairs. Um, some people ask about duplicating templates. You can certainly make a master copy and put them away. But if you damage the copy that you got from me that has all the engraved center lines, then you have a less effective copy to work from in the meantime. But it's, it's, a, it's a safety net for sure. 
And then next up is um, there are questions. I'm not going to go too far into this one, but about how you uh, set the templates up with a center line and maintain that center line. And you'll notice on the slide here in the upper right, I've got a, a video thumbnail for a video you can find on my YouTube channel. My answer to that, the short answer is I've designed my templates so that you can use the, uh, the holes drilled for the bridge, like uh, locating holes and use drill bits like locating pins. And I'm going to leave that there, but go watch the video. I explain it. I go really deep and explain exactly how to do that and basically how to rock solid be able to get templates in the exact right place and uh, and maintain a center line and i'm gonna take a quick peek in the chat here bondo is good for a mustang body dave says well yep i'm with you i'm with you dave all right so um the other thing is uh how do you attach the templates and there's definitely there's many ways you can do that um i use Primarily, I use double-sided tape and clamps. Um, I'm not sure why I don't anymore, but early on, I would occasionally put a screw through one of the existing holes, so like a bridge or a neck pocket. Uh, that's the ultimate, and it's not going to move. But I tend to use now mostly double-sided tape and clamps. And here's another thumbnail on screen for... Uh, let me pop that up for you. Uh, there's another thumbnail on screen for uh, double-sided tape, a video where I went really deep uh, in explaining that. There are millions of kinds of double-sided tape. Check out the video and I will point you at the one that has just made my life so, so happy. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Have a watch. Mike is watching from Montreal. You're just down the road from me, Mike. I'm uh, in Ottawa, where today it's I can't remember what it is. It's weirdly chilly and tomorrow it's rain. I don't know. We're having a crazy winter anyway. The next question I get a lot is does glue type matter? So I assume that's coming from people who are gluing up their own body blanks or, or possibly necks too. We're not talking about necks so much today, but uh, short answer, yes, I use tight bond. And I use Tight Bond Original, which if you look on your screen is the red bottle. And the reason I like uh, Tight Bond Original is that uh, it's, uh, it's reversible. So you may not be thinking about how do I get a body blank apart after I glue it up. But if you're gluing in a set neck or if you're gluing a fretboard on a neck and that guitar ever goes out into the world somewhere and needs some kind of repair, Getting the neck out or getting the fretboard off is going to involve steam, and that is only going to work if you didn't use a waterproof glue. Scott's asking if I've ever used formaldehyde glue. Uh, I have not. I have really only ever used tight bond, and I, I was just about to mention, I know a lot of people use uh, hide glue or fish glue, and that's, uh, to some extent, I think that's a historical thing, Scott, and I think also... Uh, someone will correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, but I think um, tight bond and other similar glues actually have water content in them as part of their makeup, but hide glues don't. So there's no concern about swelling or any kind of issues. But again, I've never had issues with tight bond, but uh, I, I've always thought that someday I might, uh, I might experiment with hide glue to see what all the fuss is about. But uh, did I hit everything there? I think I did. So uh, let me go back here full screen so you can see them. Uh, the Red Bottle Tight Bond Original, the other two, uh, basically their claims to fame are they are, uh, I forget which one is which. One is waterproof and one is water resistant. And I have no idea what either of those means, but uh, Tight Bond Original is the one I use. And uh, I put a couple of reasons up on the screen. I've noticed that uh, one of the other types, I think it's Type Bond 3, has kind of a brownish tint to it that I don't like. And if you've ever had a problem where months after your guitar is finished and painted, you can start to see or even worse, feel the seam in the body, that's called glue creep. The body halves or pieces have shifted and uh, Type Bond Original is less prone to that. Mike says, Dan, early wine loves hide glue. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very old school thing. And I mean, it probably goes back, I don't know, to, to the beginning of stringed instruments before 
uh, like white carpenters glue, PVA glues existed, uh, animal, uh, you know, glue made from animals, it was all that was available. Oh, Frank says, high glue is touchy if not mixed right. You can have a failure. Yeah, th that's the thing. I'm um, I I'm very much into details and things. As you get to know more about me, I love vintage guitars and vintage details, but I'm also not opposed to using modern uh, conveniences, two-way truss rods, uh, modern glues. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with mixing and matching. Uh, I go for more of a... Uh, modern reliability and functionality wrapped up in a vintage appearance. That's that's kind of my thing. Uh, your mileage may vary, but uh, definitely check out Type Bond Original. So next up, I get a lot of uh, how thick should bodies be and how deep are routes and all that good stuff. So that brings me to a point that I should point out. Um, in the world of guitar building, there's really, uh, there are rules. And the first rule is there are no rules. So you can make things up as you go. There's definitely better ways to do things, but um, no two people will want or will do things the same way. And you'll meet a lot of people that say, this is the only way that you can do this. So long story short, a typical body, like a slab Telecaster, is an inch and three quarters thick. Uh, thicker is not a problem. It just gets heavier. Thinner is not a problem as long as, and I'm going to grab, I've got a little poplar test body that I made years ago, but I have since sort of sliced it up into a training tool. So here's, here's a cavity that's routed from the back, but basically you can't make a body... I'm not sure, make sure everybody can see that. You can't make a body so thin that pots and switches and things won't fit without poking out the back or the top, whatever the case may be. So how thin? I would say don't go less than an inch and a half. And uh, just as an extra little tip here, I, I made a note, shaving off a little bit of thickness is a great way to reduce weight. So if you shave a 16th off a Telecaster body, uh, no one will know, even if they have it in their hands, they won't notice and it'll be a little bit lighter. Uh, Pat is asking back about glues here. What about using salt in the mix to prevent creep? You know, I've seen a lot of people say that and I don't know. I think that's not future creeping, but that's more so while you're trying to clamp two squirming pieces of wood that are, you've effectively put grease on it. The, the glue is acting like a, a lubricant. I've heard of people sprinkling salt on a glue joint, but I've never tried it. If anybody's tried that, that that's with us now, uh, let us know in the, uh, the chat if that works for you. Maybe I need to experiment with that in the future. Uh, so here is questions after how thick should a body be? So let's go back to the little demo body here. How deep should a control cavity be? So basically what I do is I like to route any cavities such that there's a quarter inch of, I'll call it a floor left here. And that's plenty strong. If this were the front of a Telecaster and this was the back of the body, that's plenty deep for pots to fit in here. And um, I think there's also a question about uh, what about the uh, rear control cavity? Well, this is a rear control cavity. So same thing, quarter inch of thickness. The thing to be aware of if you're creating a rear control cavity is instead of a pick guard, you're going to poke the, the controls through the top of the body. So just be aware, if you go much thinner than a quarter of an inch here, you're asking for something to crack or pop the body uh, if you knock a pot or a switch or something. Uh, so there's a, a, a button on that quarter inch floor or ceiling as the case may be, and you should be fine. Any questions in the chat popping up? Looks like we're clear. Let's keep going here. What order do I build a guitar body in? Well, so this is this is a personal preference thing, but there are some important things that I can point out to you. Um, uh, this is probably a good time to ask, though. Let me know in the chat. Uh, have you made a body? Are you are you just gearing up to make your first body? Are you an old pro and you've made dozens of bodies? Let me know 
where you're at while I run through this thing quickly for you. So basically I would use uh, the template to trace the body shape and then I would run it around the bandsaw or maybe a jigsaw. And uh, you're trying to get as close to the line as you can without actually touching the line. My old shop teacher used to tell me, Mike, I don't want to see any daylight outside the line. And the reason for that, well, we'll get to that later when it comes to routing, but just get as close to the line as you possibly can. Mike's gearing up to make his first body. That's awesome, Mike. All right, so we've got the body rough cut on a bandsaw. And actually, I've had a couple of questions from people in the last few weeks about do you bandsaw with the template in place? No, you don't. Uh, the reason for that is, first of all, the, the, the template doesn't help the bandsaw in any way. And even though you don't intend to cut inside the line, if you did accidentally, not only would you have uh, uh, cut your body size too small, but you will have damaged your template. So just trace it, take it off, do the bandsaw. And then you're going to move on to routing it clean with uh, your router. And now you've got the nice outer perimeter done. Then I would route the pickups and control cavities. And then I would do the neck pocket. And we're creeping up on one of those. Here's a thing that you need to remember. This is this is really not a personal choice. This is trust me on this. Uh, round over the edges before you drill the side jack. And this seems obvious to some people, but if you drill the side jack first, then you're routing the round over around the edge of the body. I don't have a jack drilled in this body, but imagine that you're routing the round over. And as you come around, here's the hole for the jack. Your router will fall into that hole and you'll eat up the corner of your body. So falling into the hole you've drilled for the jack would be very painful. Ask me how I know. Uh, decades ago, Mike did that exactly once. And that's how I never, ever forget now. So do the round over. Drill the side jack if there is one. There may not be. It might be a Strat style guitar. And then this is important. Install the neck. Bolt it on temporarily. If it's a set neck, clamp it in place. Uh, do what you got to do and then measure from the face of the nut and locate the bridge to make sure that what you're measuring agrees with your templates. So I put a lot of effort into making sure that the bridges are positioned correctly on my templates, but uh, that whole no rules thing, if you're using a neck that you bought somewhere, or if you've made a neck and maybe you had an, something like an, I won't call it an error, but uh, really what we're talking about here is the space after the last fret is not super well defined on a bolt-on neck and it definitely impacts where the bridge goes. So you may have made a choice that means the template doesn't agree with what you've built. So pop the neck in place. Don't just bl uh, blindly drill what the template says. Oh, Frank says he's made that mistake before. Oh, Scott, you're asking a great question. Uh, what about climb cutting? We'll get there. You're ahead of me, but hang tight. We're going to answer that one soon. So uh, that's basic order of building a body. Let's, uh, let's take a swig and move on to the next thing. Oh, dear. So if you've never experienced the joy that is router tear out, basically... When you're routing around the edge of your template, sometimes uh, you will find you'll grab hold of the wood with the router and tear a chunk out of it. And let me make this bigger again here. So on the left-hand side, you can see, I just grabbed this off the internet, but someone had a bad day here. They were routing and uh, it grabbed that body and tore a chunk out of it. So let me walk you through this. Um, Mrs. Popkin Guitars, I, I showed her my masterpiece that is the drawing you see on the right. And she told me, yeah, that looks complicated. It looks complicated, but it's not. And so let me walk you through this and I'll make this as clear as I can. Uh, the, the masterpiece on the top, the black thing, is you looking at your router bit from above. So if you were, let me get back here. If you were holding your router in your hands, and you were going to route around the body and you're looking down on it, then that's you looking at the router bit you see at the top of the screen here. And it spins clockwise when you look down on it. So on the left at the top, you see that climb cut. And I think I think we're answering your, uh, 
your question, Scott, about climb cutting. Climb cutting, well, okay. Uh, I am unfortunately known as a guy who loves to tell uh, analogy type stories. So let me tell you a quick story here. Remember when you were a kid and you watched a, a cartoon with Superman and the bank robbers were getting away and Superman would grab the back of the car and lift it and the bad guy floors it and the wheels are spinning, but it's not going anywhere because they're not touching the ground. That's your router when you turn it on and before you bring it to touch the wood. And then of course, there's always that great point where uh, Superman drops the car, it hits the ground and it launches like a rocket and of course crashes into the building. So that is your router when you bring it to touch the wood it wants to act like the wheel on a car. It's turning clockwise. So if you look at this climb cut picture, your router wants to travel left to right around the outside of thing. In this case, thing is the guitar body. The thing I want you to pay attention to is notice how I colored the router bit on the left. One of the tips is red, one of the tips is green. The, the red tip is the wood, the one that's meeting the wood first and it's chopping down into the wood. And that's how it's getting traction and wants to travel in the climb direction. So climb is good and bad. First of all, the thing is spinning at you know 20,000 RPMs. It wants to run away. So you have to hold it back. But the good thing is it's cutting down into the wood. So if you think of like, if you had a, a piece of wood with a knife and you were whittling, you're cutting down into the wood. And so that's going to slice the wood nice and clean. And then on the way out, the green tip, still on the picture on the left that says climb, is not doing any of the work. It's just coming out freely and, and ejecting the bits. So that's a nice clean way to cut, but it really wants to run away on you. So you've got to be really confident in your routing skills and, and hanging on tight. If you look at the image on the right, where it's labeled conventional cut, we're pulling the router backwards. It's like a car trying to drive forward and you're dragging it backwards. That sounds like it would be a bad idea, but it's actually a good idea because you can control the feed rate. And controlling the feed rate is super important because if you let it run away forward, it, it, it's gonna try to fly off the piece that you're routing. If you pull it backwards, it's gonna shave it nice and cleanly and you can pull it at a really nice slow pace. But and you knew there had to be a but, right? There's a downside to everything. When you're conventional cutting, look at the red and green tips there. The red tip, as it's coming around in my little drawing, there's no wood left to cut, it's done. But the green tip is the one that met the wood first. It's doing the cutting. And you can see in this picture, it's about to explode out the top of the wood. So remember our, uh, let me come back on screen here. Remember our whittling analogy, climb cutting, is, is doing this. Conventional cutting would be if you turned the knife over and you were pulling it towards you. And if you were doing that on a piece of wood, it might want to do this. And this is you ripping the fibers out of the wood. That doesn't always happen, but there are places on the body where it's more prone to happen. So if you, if you look at the body, I've drawn a bunch of blue dots and there's red lines and green lines. The dots are where you start routing. And red is uh, a red arrow is where you would climb cut for the best chance of not tearing out any grain. And a green arrow is where you would conventional cut for your best chance not to tear out any grain. And if you see in the, uh, the top left of the guitar body there, I've drawn some yellow lines. Those are like grain lines. So those are the grain, which is sort of like uh, the grain in wood is, think of it as like a handful of drinking straws and they run from end to end. There may be some patterns in the grain, but essentially they run from end to end. And you're trying not to grab hold of those straws and pull them up. You're trying to just shear them off nicely. Anyway, I think I may have foolishly said I wouldn't go too far into this, but come back in the replay and, and watch uh, and, and stare at this picture and it'll make sense to you. Dean is asking about using a router table. Router tables are great too, Dean. So what I'm showing you here is basically how you would route with a template on top and uh, do it entirely from the top. If you have a router table, they can be um, 
some people get a little bit nervous holding that router in their hands. And so they feel a little bit safer with a table. I prefer a table, but the thing to keep in mind is when you're using a handheld router, your hands are clamped on here. It may jump off the wood, but the bit can't get your hands. With the router table, it's entirely possible that you may jump off the bit and your hand has access to the table. Uh, yes, Frank, uh, routing safety is, is so super important. Um, it's weird. It's scary at first, and it should be because, I mean, it's a spinning knife that is very close to your fingers. But on the other hand, when you build up some confidence, if something does go a little bit squirrely, if you can have the confidence to keep your head, yes, Frank, practice. If you have enough practice that you, you keep your head I mean, it'll scare you, and uh, we're coming up on router bits. Uh, there's a combination of router bit and router table that will launch your body like a rocket across the shop. Ask me how I know, uh, but we'll we'll get there. So let me see if there's any other questions. Have a quick sip here. Jack says he has my templates and tools. Just a little nervous about getting started. Jack. Uh, if I had a nickel for every person who told me they weren't quite ready to get started, so you're not alone. And um, there's there's a, a bit of advice that I give everyone, and that is get yourself some wood to use as a practice body. And it doesn't even have to be a full body blank. But the point is practice your skills on scrap or on an inexpensive body. This is, I, I make, I go through poplar like mad because it's inexpensive. And it's, uh, I actually do use it for finished guitar bodies, but if I'm prototyping something new, I'll make uh, a, a poplar prototype with no intention of ever finishing it as a guitar. It's just, I'm improving out a concept. I'm seeing if there's any gotchas hidden in how I've designed it. And in the case of someone who's just starting out, it's just a great way to get some practice in. The, the analogy I always use is uh, either the first time you grab a baseball bat and step in the batter's box, you should not expect to know how to hit a baseball. Or the first time I hand you keys to drive a car, you've seen other people drive a car, but you have no experience whatsoever. So you shouldn't expect that the first time you touch a router to a body blank, you're going to make a guitar. You can. Practice will get you there. Scott says his first attempt was on a nice one piece mahogany body. Please use scrap wood. And, and Scott, I'm going to put this on a t-shirt someday. I swear, hashtag practice on scrap. It's uh, There's nothing more painful than ruining a, a nice body. Now, having said that, even all these years later, I mean, stuff still happens. Uh, Mrs. Potvin Guitars once said to me, you know, just understand, you're going to spoil some really nice wood flame maple neck blanks or mahogany bodies it's going to happen so prepare yourself but arm yourself ahead of time make sure you've done everything you can to 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 prevent that from happening if you can all right and that brings us to this is sort of a part two of how do you avoid uh, router tear out we'll talk a bit about that but but really the question I get a lot is, I don't know what router bits I need. And there are a million kinds of router bits and a million ways that you can use them. So just to sort of go over these quickly, first and foremost, you, you will need a template bit, also known maybe as a top bearing bit or a pattern makers bit. And they're exactly what they sound like and exactly what we want. We need something that can follow a pattern, a template, and route the piece of wood into the shape of the pattern. And I put a little note in here pointing at the bearing. If, if you're new to routing, you know that it's a sharp thing that cuts, of course, but there's a little wheel on there that's the same diameter as the cutter. And that wheel is called a bearing and it follows the template without cutting it. And only the blades cut the wood that's, that's under that template. They come in different diameters and different lengths. And you probably want a few lengths uh, I say that because you don't want to cut, it's like, for instance, if you had a one inch cutting length top bearing bit, you may not want to cut that full one inch in one go. So you might want a three quarter inch one to cut a, a little bit, switch to a one inch to cut a little bit deeper, 
then maybe take the template off and go a little bit deeper. And eventually you'll make your way all the way through that probably inch and three quarter thick body. There's another kind of router bit called a flush trim bit. And they typically have the, the bearing on the bottom, but you'll see here in some of the pictures, sometimes they have top and bottom so they can behave like both top or bottom bearing bits, which is handy. And these are super handy for um, taking the last little bit off when you flip a body over or more commonly these days, and I'm sure I'll check, but I'm sure someone is yelling at me in the comments, you can get really long ones so that you can cut the full thickness of your body in one pass. You'll notice I have a big red use with caution on the screen. The reason for that is they're great. Doing the whole thing in one pass is great. Um, it, it requires a lot of things to come together so that you can do it safely. You have to have remembered my old shop teacher and left as little wood as possible to remove with the router and you need to be as confident as you can in your routing skills and you absolutely can only do a full depth cut in a router table you cannot do it handheld and the the reason i'll the, the way i would describe the reason you can't do that or shouldn't do that is think of it this way a dragster has really wide tires so it can get really good traction and go really fast a two inch router bit is like a dragster tire it's going to get a whole lot of traction. You're holding the body in your hands. When you touch it, it has the ability to grab and launch that body. And I mean, you're talking about six, seven, eight pounds of solid wood that you might launch at your belly or across the room or your dog or who knows what. So yes, you can do it. Yes, there are, there are awesome fancy router bits that make that super easy to do. If you're just starting out, uh, do me a favor and don't try that right away. Get, get a bunch of hours routing with a top bearing bit under your belt and then consider switching to a, uh, a, a two inch or so long uh, flush trim bit. Now, speaking of that, they come in a lot of flavors. They come with spirals. Sometimes the spiral goes one way. Sometimes the spiral goes the other way. Sometimes there are combos that have both spirals. I am not going to explain that very far, but I have a slide on the next screen that'll mean something to some of you and it'll give you a good starting point to research, but we'll get there in a minute. So to wrap up router bits, you probably want some kind of round over bit. Every guitar has a, a, a radius of some kind on the edge. This one has not been radius, but uh, there are various uh, radii that are used for different types of guitars. I think a Telecaster is an eighth of an inch. Um, some things are three sixteenths of a Strats. Vintage Strats have big fat seven, I think seven sixteenths roundovers. So you'll, you'll add to your router bit collection over time. You don't need them all to start, but you probably need a top bearing bit and some roundover bits. So let's have a quick hop over to this page. And I'm just gonna let you digest this for a minute. But basically, on a spiral router bit, uh, well, Scott, uh, down cut or up cut, as you see here in the picture, is basically about, um, they refer to it here, I just grabbed this picture off the, off the web, but they refer to it as material flow. So an up cut bit is routing and it's pulling the chips up. And when it pulls the chips up, let me get on screen here. When it when it's turning and pulls the the chips up, it may burst through. I shouldn't say burst. It's going to cut upwards, and it may leave a fuzzy surface on top. And a down cut bit. If we go back to our slide here, you'll see down cut. The material flow is down. So basically, that's pushing chips down the router bit. If you're not cutting all the way through something, you're packing those bits in the slot or the piece that you're cutting. On the outside of a body, that's fine. But the thing I will say, and again, I'm gonna let you go off and research the heck out of this, but where you see material flow here, the router bit is, I, is also either pushing or pulling in that direction. So imagine that you had 
um, an upcut bit in a handheld router, it's trying to pull the piece into the router and that's fine. If you had a down cut bit, it's trying to push down the, the body is probably clamped to the table and there's no down to go. So the router is trying to lift up, which would be bad. And then if you turn that thing upside down, and this is confusing as heck to some people, when you turn the router upside down, everything behaves backwards. So a router that was spinning clockwise when you were holding it in your hands, when you turn it upside down, it's spinning counterclockwise. And an upcut bit, well, uh, up is the wrong direction now. It's now down and down is up. And I know I've just confused the heck out of everyone, but have a look at this slide, do some Googling, but until you get through using uh, top bearing bits, I would say don't worry too much about spirals. And if you're super advanced, then you can look into some nice spirals. I've got, uh, let me go back a slide here. I have got for you uh, one shown here and they don't always have a super sharp spiral. Sometimes it's just canted a bit and sometimes those are actually the best. And, and by the way, anything that I'm mentioning here, videos, uh, tools, articles, anything, I'll have links for all of this in the, the description of this video in case you want to go and read more or, or look into some of these things for yourself. Pat says he used an upcut bit rarely. The downcut bit is for inlays, in my opinion, but the compression bits. Compression bits are absolutely nice, and they're probably... I, I know that uh, uh, compression bits, uh, large diameter and very long compression bits have become super popular these days. Um, they're probably your best bet. I, I'm cautious of giving anybody any advice because I'm so wary of, uh, I've heard so many stories of people launching things because basically being timid can, can work against you. So build up some chops first. Um, compression bits are great. And uh, one last bit I'll give you actually that I should mention on a, on a router bit front. Um, the top bearing bit that you see at the top of this page you will see a million of those on Amazon or eBay, and uh, they'll be super cheap compared to the more expensive ones that I might point you at or that you might find at a, at a bigger name uh, vendor. And you absolutely want to spend a little more. You get what you pay for. The super cheap ones that you see that are a fraction of the price of the more expensive ones are cheap because they're made out of really cheap material with really cheap bearings, and they don't hold a, an edge. They don't stay sharp very long. And if you've ever heard that old saying that uh, sharp knives aren't dangerous, it's a dull knife that you have to be careful of. A dull router bit won't cut. It's going to try to bounce and skip along your workpiece. So uh, get the best router bits you can afford. That's, that's where I'm going to leave that. All right. How are we doing here? You probably got a motor along here. So... Uh, these ones are quick. How do you make a drop top? How do you add a figured top? Super easy. If you remember the how to make a Telecaster uh, order of operations that we went over, it's exactly the same, except first you prepare a probably quarter inch thick cap. And uh, Dennis is asking, can a body blank be routed completely hollow in a homemade design and with just a block underneath the hardtail bridge and a short block for the neck route? pickups fastened to the pick guard only. Absolutely. You can absolutely do that, Dennis. Um, I tend to leave a, uh, you may see one coming up here. I tend to leave a block all the way from the neck pocket down to the, uh, from the neck pocket all the way down to the bridge so that the pocket, the pickups and the bridge are all mounted in that nice thick piece of wood. Uh, you can absolutely have pickups only suspended in the top. Uh, the thing to be aware of, uh, and I'm by no means an expert in this area, but pickups that are suspended, uh, the top, if the top is thin enough that it can move, that's where you might start to get some uh, microphonic or feedback problems. Not always. A quarter inch top is pretty thick. But in any case, to make your uh, drop top, or a figured top with a, a, a drop top with figured wood. Uh, you would basically prepare the same body blank that you would normally would, except you need it to be about an inch and a half thick. 
and then you would do the same thing, probably book match a quarter inch thick top, and together they add up to an inch and three quarters, and then you would just use it exactly like you would a one piece, like a, a single thickness, except you've got a nice sandwich of two things. The thing to keep in mind is that uh, alignment is pretty important on them. If you've got a book match top, it's got a seam down the center of the body. And if you've made a multi-piece body blank for the back, I tend to make two pieces. Um, so it has a center seam also. So you wanna make sure those seams stay one exactly on top of the other. And the way I do that is I clamp them up dry and I drive a screw in all four corners. And then I take those screws out apply the glue, pop it back in place. And when that top is trying to squirm all around, I drive the screws in just enough to grab the hole so it can't move and then I clamp the heck out of it. Uh, so that is the magic of a drop top. And then the follow-up step uh, question rather that I usually get to that is, uh, that's awesome, what if I wanna hollow that out? You can absolutely hollow those out. Uh, what I do is basically follow the same steps we just did for the drop top, except first we're going to route some chambers. Uh, on the screen here, you can see a typical chamber uh, template that I offer. Basically, you can hog out most of the wood with a, uh, a drill bit. I'm showing you a picture of a Forstner bit here. That's a type of drill bit that's a larger diameter, cuts nice clean holes. And then you can leave a, a little less work to route with your router. Then you glue a top on, and then again, just like it was a slab body, off you go with all the pickup routes, routing the perimeter of the body. Uh, I've got a few tips here, and uh, one is not quite so obvious, but the Forstner bit that I'm showing you here and that I've left the link for in the description, you can sort of double duty here. Uh, if you get one that's the exact size you need for a side jack, they are the best things I've ever found to drill a nice, clean side jack. So buy one to do side jacks with, and then you can also use it to do a little hogging out of any chambers. And super important, when you hog out the chambers on the inch and a half thick body blank, even if it was nice and dry, there may be a tendency for it to want to curl up. It, it may want to start to curl up like a potato chip. So have your top prepared. And as soon as you're done routing the chambers, glue that top on right away, clamp it. And even then the top may not be enough to overcome the, the body blanks attempt to curl. But if you leave it a little bit thick, you might be able to run it through a planer or a sander if you happen to have one. But for the most part, just get the cap on as fast as you can would be my suggestion. How are we doing for questions here? Sharpening has allowed me to use cheaper bits with success, Justin says. That's that's fair. Well, okay. So yes, cheaper uh, white side bits are still, you know, good quality bits. The thing to be aware of, and I guess it's not that terribly important. Sharpening a bit makes them a tiny bit smaller in diameter uh, at times, and that can be important. But I guess for our purposes, that's not super important. But like like you, I've always used white side or uh, high end bits that hold an edge for quite a while, so it's usually not an issue. Uh, Justin is asking, I don't know if a spiral bit can be sharpened by a DIYer. I, I doubt it would be. It would be pretty hard. You might be able to just like uh, a straight flute bit. You might be able to just kiss it with a file and try to put a little bit of an edge back on it. Uh, but a, a spiral, I actually don't even know. Someone can tell me if, if they can get uh, uh, a spiral bit on some kind of a grinder to regrind the edge. Dean asks, where do you get good quality drill bits? Drill bits, um, I can leave you some links. If you check the description, I've left a drink to, uh, blah, blah, blah. I've left a link to that Forstner bit. Uh, it is a uh, really nice, sharp cutting. Uh, I've had good success with them. Um, again, these are the kinds of things that you'll find super cheap on Amazon or eBay. Um, the, the, the giveaway is usually the more it costs, the better quality it is. Um, that's something to be aware of. The, um, they tend to last quite a while, although I will say using a Forstner bit to drill side jacks, because you're drilling into end grain, drill bits don't love end grain, and you'll get some smoking and complaining. Uh, they, that particular bit you will probably buy more than one of in your lifetime for sure. 
Uh, what should I look for if a bit is getting dull, Scott says? A, uh, a router bit, I assume you mean, Scott? I'm going to assume you mean a router bit. Um, the, the, the classic test that you'll see uh, old uh, shop guys do is they'll take the edge of the bit and try and shave your fingernail, try and scrape your fingernail. And if that thing just skates across your fingernail and you can't shave any nail off, that bit is dull. Don't, I would probably say it's time to replace that bit. Make sense? Cool. All right, let's keep rolling here. Tips for carving a top. Well, I'll give you everything from uh, crazy wild west to the, the easiest thing I can think of. I, in my early days, would use an angle grinder. And I was not trying to make any particular shape. I was just interested in making swoopy, carvy tops. And I have come to know a few other builders. And I was surprised to see that they actually use uh, grinders as well. It, it's just a thing you can develop. It's kind of like those guys who use a chainsaw on a log and suddenly it's a grizzly bear or something. You can sort of get a knack for that. Um, the, the, the disc you would put on there is a flap sander. So it's, it's like the most aggressive sanding thing you've ever held in your hands, including a belt sander. Uh, so be aware that it removes a lot of wood fast. But the, uh, the thing that I would probably suggest is something look, uh, that looks like the templates that you see on screen here. Um, this is a set of templates that I have for uh, a Les Paul style carve. And basically, you use them one at a time with your regular old top bearing bit. You'll need a shorter one because you're going to route a series of probably eighth inch or so steps in the top of the body. And that's just to remove most of the wood and get the shape almost there. And then you're going to use whatever you have, sander, grinder, chisels, scrapers, whatever you've got to hand to smooth out those steps and end up with a nice smooth carve in the top. And, uh, and that's probably the, the easiest way to get there. Those kinds of templates are not available for a lot of guitar models because not many guitar models have really uh, documented the shape of their carves so uh, rigorously that it's easy to make a set of templates like this. So otherwise, just uh, use anything that you have, uh, chisels, scrapers, sanding, the thing to be aware of is if you're carving something with a different material as the top, you probably want to leave a uniform thickness all the way around so it sort of emulates binding, and that can be a little bit tricky. So hopefully that gives you some uh, getting started tips. Here's another one I get so often that I'm going to take a swig before I start. How do I position the bridge? And the short answer, as I say here, is... You, go, you need to have your neck in place and you need to measure from the nut to the scale length. So let's just say we're working on a 25 and a half inch scale guitar. You're going to measure from the face of the nut, 25 and a half inches, draw that line on the body. And that is what we'll call the, the theoretical scale length line. And I say theoretical because scale length uh, let me back up a second. Scale length is the, technically, is the amount of string from the face of the nut to where it the, crosses the bridge saddle that is free, like a skipping rope, to move. And on a thinner string, you can actually almost use the exact scale length or maybe just a hair more. But a thicker string, as it crosses the bridge, the thickness of the string impedes that skipping rope ability. So you need to push the saddle a little bit further away so that it effectively has 25 and a half inches of skipping rope that can move. So all that was to say, draw the scale length line on the body, on the bridge, and I'm gonna come back to the slide here. I've just shown a typical hardtail bridge here. These saddles are probably in the middle or towards the furthest away from the neck they can be. And you would use a screwdriver to turn the adjustment screws and you can see the springs there will push the saddles forward. So that would be towards us in the way it's pictured on the screen. And they'll push the saddles forward towards the neck. So move them all as far forward as they can go and then 
position that bridge so that the high E saddle is right on the scale length line, maybe just a touch ahead of it. And that means that it's ready to intonate there. And the other five saddles can all be pushed back for the thicker and thicker and thicker strings till you can get them to intonate. And I won't go into how to do the intonation, but that's basically how you position your bridge. And here's one thing that I'll, I'll mention. I get this question so often, and I see it so many times in Facebook groups that uh, it, it's just uh, like smoke comes out of my ears. People will ask, I mean, let's use a Telecaster, for example, how far is a Telecaster bridge from the neck pocket? Or on a Les Paul, people will, will say, how far is the bridge from the bridge pickup? Oh, my pleasure, Scott. It's it's really, it's it's so many things about guitar building. So I Sorry to stop in the middle of an explanation. Scott is saying that the mystery is solved on scale length and saddle position. So many of these aspects of guitar building, people are just, their minds are boggled about it because there's so much misinformation on the interwebs. Uh, Facebook groups, I sometimes, I, I can't, even after I've had coffee, I can't read through Facebook groups because I can't believe the misinformation that's out there. But once you understand this stuff, I'm a big believer in don't just memorize what I'm telling you to do. I like to try to give you the why so that if any element of the thing ever changes, uh, maybe you're not using a hardtail bridge, maybe you're using a tutomatic bridge, knowing the why means you have the theory. So you still know how to do this, even though some aspect of it is different than we started with. You're so much better off than the guy who memorized where a Telecaster bridge goes. Ron says he got detained and didn't make the start. No worries, Ron. No worries. Uh, there'll be a replay and you can watch back and uh, uh, leave me a comment uh, and tell me how I did. So uh, that, that was my big caveat. The bridge position is not measured from the neck pocket or anything else. It is measured from the face of the nut. And there's nothing more to be said about that. Let's just leave that there. Uh, and I mentioned here, Stumac has a great... Um, fret spacing and bridge placement calculator. I'll leave a link to that in the description for this video. And you just basically plug in your scale length, number of frets, is it a guitar or a bass? And boom, it spits out, uh, here's where all the fret positions are. And for these various types of bridges, this is where the bridge should go. I say should, remember back a few slides ago, we said, don't just read the number and trust it and drill. You now know how to figure out exactly where it goes but it's kind of comforting when your measurements line up with what the calculator spat out. And that just makes things that much more solid in your mind that you're doing the right thing. So that's bridge position. Uh, how do you drill string through holes without a drill press? I get this one a lot. And uh, there's no easy answer to this. The answer is by a drill press. I understand that not everyone's budget or uh, shop space allows for a drill press. You don't need a full-size floor standing drill press. Even a bench top one will do. Just be sure that it is deep enough. And by that, I mean from the chuck that holds the drill bit to the post that holds up the motor. I think it's seven inches that most, uh, most drill presses that we want for guitar building are. And the reason for that is if you look at the picture here on the left, it, this is me drilling string holes on the back of a tally body. And you can see the drill bit is above the holes and you can't quite make it out, but the bottom of the body is, is fairly close to the post. If it were any smaller drill press, it could not reach far enough into the middle of the body to drill those holes. So Mike, I don't have enough money or shop space for a drill press. Tony says at least six and a half. There you go. Uh, you tell me you don't have enough money or space for a drill press. I hear that. I've never used uh, the device you see on the right on screen here, but I have heard lots of people use it with success. Basically, it's a portable drill press for your hand drill. Hand drill pops on top, drill goes in the secondary chuck, and those springs act like the up and down and keep it perpendicular. Um, other than that, if anyone else has got any suggestions, uh, fire them off in the chat, but uh, that's the best help I can offer you. So zooming along, here was how I solved that problem when I first started and I didn't have uh, the right size drill press. Um, I had a very small bench top drill press and I started making these blocks that replaced the ferrules in the back of the guitar. 
and I could drill from the front and be a little bit sloppy because it was hidden by the bridge. And on the back, the sloppy holes were covered up. You can cover a ton of sins with a nice routed slot and a block that you pop in there. So that's something to consider. So on the left, you see a typical block that I make these days and the slot routed to accept them. And on the right, you see a template for routing the slot. Please, please, please don't get confused. The template does not make the blocks. I make the blocks. And the reason I say that I make them is because I don't want you to make them. If I made a template small enough to make that block, your hands would be so scary close to the router bit that I don't even want to think about it. So the thing in the, the picture that looks like it might be a block is to help you position the template to route the slot. And then you take the block that you got from me and it just pops in there. And I don't, don't have a guitar handy that has one of my wooden blocks. Let me see if I can show this to you. This is a, a very old shop model that I keep around, one of the earlier builds I made, where I actually made the block out of brass. And at the time, I didn't really have the tools, so I was really caveman machining brass blocks. And then I had a thought that if I made these things out of some fancier wood, it would really upscale my builds and, and add kind of a really classy touch to it. So that's what I started doing. And uh, I've, they're plenty strong. People worry that you might pull the strings through. That's not going to happen. So if, uh, if you're not a purist that needs uh, string ferrules on the back of your Telecaster, and in fact, you want to classy up a build, uh, have a look at the string blocks uh, that I have. I've got links in the description again. Neck pockets. Well, let's, let's bring this home with the most popular how do I do this uh, question that I get. How tight should a neck pocket be? How do you make a set neck pocket? One of those is an easy question. A set neck pocket in general is no different than a bolt-on pocket. You need a template and you route a pocket in the body. The difference between them generally is that a set neck pocket is tighter. So in the case of a bolt-on, uh, Leo Fender decided that he wanted his guitars to be very serviceable. So the necks are removable. You can put a different neck on, different size, different shape, what have you. If you break it, you can swap it. You don't have to steam a neck out. Yay. When you paint your body, you don't paint the entire neck pocket, but you do need a little bit of paint in the pocket to hide the edges. So that adds a little bit of thickness. And your neck probably has some finish on it as well. So that adds a little bit of thickness. So all that's a long-winded way of saying a bolt-on neck when you are holding the raw wood in your hands that you've just finished routing, has a much looser fit. I know some people like to make them super snug, but you'll also find there are a lot of people who find out the hard way that after you paint them and you try to force that neck in that pocket, you're going to crack your paint job or chip it. So it's a little bit looser. When it comes to a set neck, we're gluing the neck in raw wood to raw wood and for that, we want a proper woodworking joint, was a which is a little bit tighter. The one thing I'll say there to wrap that up is you'll see a lot of people on the internet, and I've done this myself. You make your neck, you make your body with the neck pocket, you press the neck in, and then you proudly grab the neck and lift the body up to show people how snug your neck pocket is. That's great. I've done it myself. But the reality is that that's too tight for a neck joint. You need room for glue. In that case, what's going to happen is when you put glue on both sides and push them together, you're going to scrape all the glue off and it's not going to be a really strong neck joint. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't move when you slip it in, but it should slip in very easily. You shouldn't have to press it in hard or tap it in. And, and that's going to end up with the best glue joint imaginable. Mike says, for a set neck, the thing I struggle with figuring out was how deep the pocket should be. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mike. That's a good question. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I wrote, uh, I actually wrote an article about this. I get this question a lot. The short answer for you, Mike, is for a bolt-on neck, like a fender style, five-eighths of an inch deep is the magic number. <clears throat> the article goes into reasons for why that is. In the world of set necks, uh, the non-answer is it's up to you. So when someone asks me how thick is the, the heel 
on a set neck. My question back to them is, I don't know, how deep did you make the neck pocket? So your, your quest is to make a pocket of a certain depth and a heel of a certain thickness to get the strings where you need them. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So let me grab a sip of water and we'll head over there. So angled neck pockets. How do you determine a neck angle? So the bridge height is what drives the neck angle. I won't go too far into this, but let me just show you some quick show and tell. Here's the TV yellow double cut again. This is a fender style bridge. And I'll try and show you profile wise. It's very low. It's 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 maybe three eighths of an inch tall. So it's quite short, like it's it's close to the body. So no neck angle, meaning the neck is parallel to the body. The strings come across and they meet the, the bridge saddles at a comfortable height so that the strings are not laying on the frets. And we can adjust them up and down and life is good. No neck angle. The flip side of that is a sort of Gibson-y style tunematic bridge where it's much taller. It's higher off the body. It's probably double the height of the other one, maybe three quarters of an inch. And if we had no neck angle there, the strings would slam into the bridge halfway up its height. I'm trying to show you here about halfway up the height and we wouldn't be able to play to to get over the saddles and if we cranked the saddles down there's just no good way to do it so the answer is angle the neck and the strings and shoot the strings up at a higher angle so they meet the bridge where we want it to that's why you need a neck angle uh so to, to achieve that, getting the strings up higher off the bridge or off the deck of the body, there's, there's three things you can do. You can angle the neck pocket. You can angle the heel on the neck. Or you could <clears throat> recess the, the bridge into the body. So let's work backwards. If we go back to our picture here, if you look at the, the left-hand picture of the nice quilty body, I found this uh, on the interwebs. It's a tunematic style bridge, but what they've done is they've routed a slot so that the bridge can sink into the body. And now it's the same height as our super low pro profile fender style bridge. So now you don't need a neck angle. The only thing I'll say about that, I'll say two things about that. One is on the right, you'll see, I actually have a template to help you make that slot. And the other thing to be aware of is when you do that, notice the strings past the bridge there's less of a downward angle there. So you've taken some of the pressure off the strings as they cross the bridge. If you're an aggressive player, you might pop those strings out. There's a reason why the neck angle exists using a, a Gibson style bridge, and that's to get that downward pressure with a bridge of that height. So keep that in mind. Uh, the angle on the heel is something I don't prefer to do because you end up with weird gaps at the end of the heel and the, and the bottom of the neck pocket. So backwards, we arrive at number one, the thing I prefer, and that is to angle the neck pocket. So uh, the question then is, how do you route an angled neck pocket? Um, Ron says, sorry, too quick on that. Oh, Ron, if you don't have any neck angle, how far would you have to recess a wrap tail to make it work? Well, same math. So however high uh, let's say a Telecaster bridge is, um, I, I don't have the number right here in my head, but let's say it's three eighths of an inch. You're going to need to drop that down so that your bridge saddles are that same three eighths of an inch off the deck. Um, on the, the, uh, there's a link in the description. And on the previous slide, I mentioned, I wrote an article. I go into all the gory deep details on this, but oftentimes when you're using that style of bridge, Ron, you're probably building a set neck. And again, now, how deep is your neck pocket? How thick is your neck? It's all just math. And that article will explain it to you really simply. But you're basically trying to get the strings to meet the bridge saddles 
at an acceptable height so they're not laying on the frets and they're not a mile off of the frets. So you're kind of the math master when it comes to that, uh, that decision. So routing that angled neck pocket, uh, there's a couple of ways to achieve that. The way that I tend to do it, and you'll see I've got a picture of it there, is I use a set of wedges. And so that three, and I should have mentioned that angle typically for a flat top guitar with the Gibson style big bridge is three degrees. And the way I might do that is with a pair of these wedges, have a look at the picture. You'll see there's a neck pocket there laying on a set of these wedges. So if you take the wedges, lay them on your body, well, you're going to do a better job than me balancing them in the air like this, but you'll fix these on here with, with double-sided tape. Then you'll fix your template on here with double-sided tape. And now you're routing a nice three degree angle in the neck pocket. And if I were to take this further apart, you can see that the neck pocket is thinner here than it is up here. So I've done exactly that. I've routed a three degree angle in the body. So that's how I would route uh, an angled neck pocket. Now, um, depending on, I should flip over here, depending on the body shape, Sometimes it's uh, not easy to get one of the wedges where the uh, treble side cutaway is. In that case, you can always put the template down first and then put the wedges on top. And now you've got like two little ski ramps on the template. Pat says he bought the angled wedges, but would also like to get some in different angles. Well, so there is a three degree already, uh, Pat. You, you, and, and I should mention the three degrees, uh, you'll hear people give you different numbers, two point something, three point something. Uh, you, you can play with that. You just have to be really sure that your, your math is good uh, and, and that they work out for you. But Ron, uh, get in touch and, and let me know what you need and we'll see uh, how we can work that out. And then the last thing I'll say here is uh, how do you carve or how do you route an angled neck pocket on a carve top? The... The easy answer is you route it before you carve the top and that way it's still flat and you can get a flat template to sit on it. If you don't have that luxury, if you've already carved it because you weren't sure of the order of operations or maybe you bought a carved top body, then at that point you're left pretty much with building a jig that has a three degree ramp in it that is suspended above your body so that your router can ride on that ramp and reach through it and, and route the pocket in the body. Maybe we should do a, 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 a jigs talk sometime about all the cool things you can build for your shop. All right, so we're rolling along here. That's what I have for today. That pretty much covers all the questions. Let me just have a quick look at the chat here. Scale length position. Struggled figuring out how deep a neck pocket should be. Yep, yep. It's uh, it, it's it's mind-boggling at first, and then you sit down and draw it out with some math. That's another great idea is always draw things out. Scott, yes. So you've hit on a thing there. This this confuses a lot of people. So the, the neck angle specifically on a Les Paul is not three degrees, but it is three degrees. If we drew the triangle that is the strings and the bridge on a flat top guitar, like this one that I just showed you, the three degree angle on a Les Paul is still three degrees off the deck of the body. What you can't always see on a Les Paul, let me flip to full screen here. On a Les Paul, the bridge area of the body is much thicker than it is down here at the neck pocket end. That is called the pickup plane. It's the angle, the plane that the pickups sit in. And that angle on a Les Paul is, is about one and a half degrees. It's 1.4 something, 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 1.5 degrees. So 1.5 degrees of angle here means if we need a three degree neck angle, we need three more degrees, three plus one and a half, four and a half. So you'll see that these wedges that I have come in two flavors, either these three degree versions or a kit that has two sets of wedges, 1.5 and 
there you go. Is the end of the pocket angled? Dean, C, D, C, Dean. I'm not sure what you're asking me, but let me show you up real close here. This, this thick end of the pocket and this thin end of the pocket, however deep they are, they produce a three degree angle and it's three degrees as measured from this flat top. Pat says a jigs talk would be fantastic. I I am known, uh, just so you know, I am known amongst my fellow builders. One of them once called me Mr. Fancy Jigs. I have a rule in my shop. If I'm working on something and uh, it doesn't end well, I ruin a piece of wood or I can't do something reliably, uh, I get so frustrated that I grind everything to a halt and I devise a, a thing, a jig, a fixture, something, to make that process repeatable and fun. And if I can't come up with a way to do it, then I just don't do that thing anymore. Uh, life is too short to be frustrated by uh, building guitars. It should be fun. So I, I've uh, come up with all sorts of jigs and things to make uh, make things repeatable, accurate, and, and fun. Yes, Scott, you would uh, route the pickups at one and a half degrees as well. You'll notice that uh, Les Paul pickup rings are actually, they come in bridge and neck versions. One is thicker than the other, but the pickup rings are actually angled too, to help produce some angle. All right. Well, I'm going to say we covered all the questions. I don't see any more questions. Let me just have a quick chat. Let's check on the chat here. Looks like we're good. Uh, I see a question about uh, how do you use the bridge and locating pins? How do you do the bridge placement with a GoTo 5? Yeah, have a look at the uh, have a look at the video that I mentioned earlier about using the templates, five tips for you to getting started with your templates where I explain all the uh, locating pins and uh, uh, placement. And uh, that will make much more sense. I've got the pins and the templates and a body in my hands. And uh, it's much easier to, to, it's easier for me to show you than it is to tell you with words here. Well, thank you, Gary. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. All right. Well, before we go, I want to ask you guys, what was the most valuable thing you learned here today? What are you going to go away and put to work in your shop uh, on the build you're working on or the build that you're about to start? Let me know in the comment, in, uh, in the chat rather. And uh, if you're watching this later, uh, then by all means, uh, leave me a comment. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for subscribing and thank you for uh, joining me today. Take care.